Well, welcome, 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 welcome to the miracle work. And we're going to take it easy today. That's my feeling. Let's take it easy today. So I don't know exactly what that means, but I know for sure <clears throat> that we're not going to make any kind of sacrifice here. So the, the title of the section that we're looking at today is Atonement Without Sacrifice. And, and atonement is then the idea of undoing, of, um, say, recognizing your one without a sacrifice. So without thinking that you need to do something for it, that you have to sacrifice your life for it, or that you, who knows what idea you can hold about it. And um, so uh, this is very helpful. So there in this section, this is quite a long section. It's about 20 minutes if you read it um, one after the other, which is not necessary. But uh, it's like if you read it, you see that there's a lot uh, of um, information about a very specific person. And Jesus is actually directly talking about this person which is Edgar Casey, and he he wrote a couple of books and he yeah he was quite involved in the say Course in Miracles uh, community and maybe no he probably still isn't but I don't know um, nevertheless so there's a lot of uh, talking about him and about how he does things um, that have to do with the idea of sacrifice and you're saying oh well what's so interesting about that and the thing is that it is interesting to hear Jesus talk about a person because you hardly ever hear that so so that's one thing that we're going to take a look at and the other part is some biblical uh, sections that are misinterpreted by the established religion um, by their, yeah, uh, say the Christian religion. And that's going to be readjusted too. Um, in, in this moment that we're together, that we're listening, that is readjusted in what Jesus shares with us today, which is really helpful, at least when I read it, it's like, oh, I'm so happy to read this. So now we start is always different in a different way and um, so that's what I'm going to do today like I said I I love to take it easy today because we we are fully on in this and it's good to also just sometimes just listen just like we do with Joel Goldsmith too it's like oh let's sit back and listen to Joel but here it is like let's sit back and listen to uh, this specific uh, section of the chapter which is uh, atonement without sacrifice. Let's listen to that. Um, I I made an uh, say audio book of the whole or text, and this is part of that too. So you can find it. I think it's on the EBHub website too still, uh, but otherwise on the or text of course in miracles dot com web um, channel of YouTube, and that's where I stream this from now too. So you'll see it. And um, you hear two voices, so it's my voice and the voice of Anjula Ram. I, I did the first 20 chapters with her. We, we met on a daily basis, reading A Course in Miracles, recording it. It was cover time. We, had <laughs> we um, just happened to find each other doing so. And um, so that's how that was. And so chapter 3. We're, we're in chapter 3C of the Ur text, and we're going to take a listen to it. So it's with, with French subtitles. That's really great. They're auto-generated, so they might not be that good, but it's the best I can do right now. So, and you see the beautiful picture of uh, um, Dali, The Last Supper. I, I really love that. That's why I used it. And, um, okay, Retraining the Mind is the chapter, and this is Atonement Without Sacrifice. So we're going to take a listen to that. All right. Ur-Text Manuscripts, 
complete seven volume combined edition volume one chapter three section atonement without sacrifice there's one more point which must be perfectly clear before any res residual fear which may still be associated with miracles becomes entirely groundless the crucifixion did not establish the atonement the resurrection did this is a point which many very sincere Christians have misunderstood nobody who was free of the scarcity fallacy could possibly have made this mistake if the crucifixion is seen from an upside down point of view it certainly does appear as if God permitted and even encouraged one of his sons to suffer because he was good. Many devoted ministers preach this every day. This particularly unfortunate interpretation, which actually arose out of the combined misprojection of a large number of my own would-be followers, has led many people to be bitterly afraid of God. This particularly anti-religious concept happens to enter into many religions, and this is neither by chance nor coincidence. The real Christian would have to pause and ask, how could this be? Is it likely that God himself would be capable of the kind of thinking which his own words have clearly stated is unworthy of man? There are times when the best defense, as always, is not to attack another's position, but rather to protect the truth. It is not necessary to consider anything acceptable if you have to turn the whole frame of reference around in order to justify it. This procedure is painful in its minor applications and genuinely tragic on a mass basis. Persecution is frequent as a frequent result, justifying the terrible misperception that God himself persecuted his own son on behalf of salvation. The word the very words are meaningless. It has always been particularly difficult to overcome this because, although the error itself is no harder to overcome than any other error, men were unwilling to give it up because of its prominent escape value. In milder forms, a parent says, this hurts me more than it hurts you, and feels exonerated in beating a child. Can you believe that the father really thinks this way? It is so essential that all such thinking be dispelled, that we must be very sure that nothing of this kind remains in our mind. I was not punished because you were bad. The wholly benign lesson which the atonement teaches is wholly lost if it is tainted with this kind of distortion in any form. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, is strictly a karmic viewpoint. It is a real misperception of truth by which man assigns his own evil past to God. The evil conscience from the past has nothing to do with God. He did not create it and he does not maintain it. God does not believe in karmic retribution at all. His divine mind does not create that way. He does not hold the evil deeds of a man even against himself. It is likely then that we would hold against any man the evil that another did be very sure that you recognize how impossible this assumption really is and how entirely it arises from misprojection. This kind of error is responsible for a host of related fallacies, including the misbelief that God rejected man and forced him out of the Garden of Eden, or that I am misdirecting you. I have made every effort to use words which are almost impossible to distort. But man is very inventive when it comes to twisting symbols around. God himself is not symbolic, he is fact. The atonement too is totally without symbolism. 
is perfectly clear because it exists in light. Only man's attempts to shroud it in darkness have made it inaccessible to the unwilling and ambiguous to the partly willing. The atonement itself radiates nothing but true. It therefore epitomizes harmlessness and sheds only blessing. It could not do this if it arose from anything other than perfect innocence. Innocence is wisdom because it is unaware of evil which does not exist. It is, however, perfectly aware of everything that is true. The resurrection demonstrated that nothing can destroy truth. Good can withstand any form of evil because light abolishes all forms of darkness. The atonement is thus the perfect lesson. It is the final demonstration that all of the other lessons which I taught are true. Man is released from all errors if he believes in this. The deductive approach to teaching accepts the generalization which is applicable to all single instances, rather than building up the generalization after analyzing numerous single instances separately. If you can accept the one generalization now, there will be no need to learn from many smaller lessons. Nothing can prevail against the Son of God, who commands his spirit into the hands of his Father. By doing this, the mind awakens from its sleep, and the soul remembers its Creator. All sense of separation disappears, and level confusion vanishes. The Son of God is part of the Holy Trinity, but the Trinity itself is one. There is no confusion within its levels, because they are of one mind and one will. The single purpose creates perfect integration and establishes the reign of the peace of God. But this vision can be perceived only by the truly innocent. Because their hearts are pure, they defend true perception instead of defending themselves against it. Understanding the les lesson of the atonement, they are without the will to attack, and therefore they see truly. This is what the Bible means when it says, And when he shall prosper, or be perceived, we shall be like him, or we shall, be, or we shall see him as he is. Sacrifice is a notion totally unknown to God. It arises solely from fear of the records. This is particularly unfortunate because frightened people are apt to be vicious. Sacrificing others in any way is a clear-cut violation of God's own injunction that man should be merciful even as his Father in Heaven is merciful. It has been harder for many Christians to realize that this commandment or assignment also applies to themselves. Good teachers never terrorize their students. To terrorize is to attack, and this results in rejection of what the teacher offers. This results in learning failures. I've been correctly referred to in the Bible as the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. Those who represent the Lamb as blood-stained, an all too widespread conceptual error, do not understand the meaning of the symbol. Correctly understood, the symbol is a very simple parable or teaching device which merely depicts my innocence. The lion and the lamb lying down together refers to the fact that strength and innocence are not in conflict but naturally live in peace. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God is another way of saying the same thing. Only the innocent can see God. There has been some controversy in human terms as to whether seeing in an attribute of the eyes or an expression of the integrative power of the brain correctly understood the issue revolves around the question of whether the body or the mind can see or understand. This is not really open to question at all. The body is not capable of understanding. 
Only the mind knows anything. A pure mind knows the truth, and this is its strength. It cannot attack the body because it knows exactly what the body is. This is what a sane mind in a sane body really means. A sane mind is not out for blood. It does not confuse destruction with innocence, because it associates innocence with strength, not with weakness. Innocence is incapable of sacrificing anything because the innocent mind has everything and strives only to protect its wholeness. This is why it cannot misproject. It can only honor man because honor is the natural greeting of the truly loved to others who are like them. The Lamb taketh away the sins of the world only in the sense that the state of innocence or grace is one in which the meaning of the atonement is perfectly apparent. The innocence of God is the true state of the mind of his Son. In this state, man's mind does see God, and because he sees him as he is, he knows that the atonement, not sacrifice, is the only appropriate gift to his own altar, where nothing except perfection truly belongs. The understanding of the innocent is truth. That is why their altars are truly radiant. Hmm. Dictated directly without notes, though Christians generally, but by no means universally, recognize the contradiction involved in victimizing others, they are less adept at ensuring their own inability to victimize themselves, although this appears to be a much more benign error from the viewpoint of society. It is nevertheless inherently dangerous because once a two-edged defense is used, its direction cannot be self-controlled. Bill recently observed how many ideas were condensed into relatively few pages here. This is because we have not been forced to dispel miscreations throughout. There is one set of notes not yet transcribed, which is devoted to this. These emphasize only the enormous waste of time that is involved. Casey's notes too could have been much shortened. Their excessive length is due to two factors. The first involves a fundamental error which Casey himself made and which required constant undoing. The second is more related to the attitude of his followers. They are unwilling to omit anything he said. This is respectful enough, but not overly judicious. I would be a far better editor if they would allow me this position on their staff. It is obvious that Casey himself was not able to transcend the misperceptions of the need for sacrifice, or he could not possibly have been willing to sacrifice himself. Anyone who is unable to leave the requests of others unanswered has not entirely transcended egocentricity. I never gave of myself in this inappropriate way, nor would I ever have encouraged Casey to do so. Casey and his devotion to me are in no way underestimated by the realization that he worked under very great strain, which is always a sign that something is wrong. One of the difficulties inherent in trance states is that it is very difficult to overcome the split which the trance itself induces through the medium of communications made while in the trance state. Casey's whole approach put him in a real double bind from which he did not recover. When he spoke of a dream in which he saw his own rather imminent reincarnation, he was perfectly accurate. He was sufficiently attuned to real communication to make it easy to correct his errors and free him to communicate without strain. It is noticeable throughout his notes that he frequently engaged in a fallacy that we have already noted in some detail, namely the tendency to endow the physical with non-physical properties. 
Casey suffered greatly from this error. He did not make either of the, the other three. However, you will remember that it is this one which is particularly vulnerable to magical associations. Casey's accuracy was so great that even when he did this, he was able to apply it constructively. But it does not follow that this was a genuinely constructive approach. It should also be noted that when Casey attempted to see the body in proper perspective, he saw physically discernible auras surrounding it. This is a curious compromise in which the non-physical attributes of the self are approached as if they could be seen with the physical eye. Casey's illiteracy never stood in his way. This is because illiteracy does not necessarily imply any lack of love, and in Casey's case, very definitely did not. He therefore had no difficulty at all in overcoming his seeming limitation. What did hamper him was a profound sense of personal unworthiness, which, characteristically enough, was sometimes overcompensated for in what might be called a Christian form of grandiosity. Casey's, Casey was essentially uncharitable to himself. This made him very erratic in his own miracles and, because he was genuinely anxious to help others, left himself in a highly vulnerable position. His son comments both on the rather erratic nature of the Casey household and also on the rather uneven nature of Casey's temper. Both of these observations are true and clearly point to the fact that Casey did not apply the peace of God to himself. Once this had occurred, particularly in a man whose communication channels were open, it was virtually impossible for him to ex escape external solutions. Casey was a very religious man who should have been able to escape fear through religion. Being unable to apply his religion wholeheartedly to himself, he was forced to accept search certain magical beliefs which were alien to his own Christianity. This is why he was so different when he was asleep and even disowned what he said in this state. The lack of integration which this split state implies is clearly shown in certain off-the-mark detours into areas such as effects of stones on the mind and some curious symbol attempt to integrate churches and glands. This is hardly more peculiar than some of your own confusion. Casey's mind was imprisoned to some extent by an error against which you have been cautioned several times. He looked to the past for an explanation of the present, but he never succeeded in separating the past from the present. When he said, mind is the builder, he did not realize that it is only what it is building now that really creates the future. The past in itself does not have the ability to do this. Whenever we move from one instant to the next, the previous one no longer exists. In considering the body as the focus for healing, Casey was expressing his own failure to accept this as accomplished. He did not fail to recognize the value of the atonement for others but he did fail to accept its corrective merit for himself. As we have frequently emphasized, man cannot control his own errors. Having created them, he does believe in them. Because of his failure to accept his own perfect freedom from the past, Casey could not really perceive others as similarly free. This is why I have not wholly endorsed the Casey documents for widespread use. I am heartily supportive of the R's endeavor to make Casey's singular contributions immortal, but it would be most unwise to have them promulgated as a faith until they have been purged of their essential errors. 
This is why there have been a number of unexplained setbacks in their explication. It is also one of the many reasons why the Casey material, a major step in the speed up, must be properly understood before it can be meaningfully validated. Casey's son has been wise in attempting to deal with reliability, which in Casey's case is very high. There's a way of validating the material and Huge Lin is perfectly aware that this must be done eventually. He is also aware of the fact that he is in, unable to do it. In the present state of the material, it would be most unwise even to attempt it. There's too much that is invalid. When the time comes that this can be corrected to the point of real safety, I assure you, it will be accomplished. In tribute to Casey, I remind you that no effort is wasted and Casey's effort was very great. It would be most ungrateful of me if I allowed his work to produce a generation of witch doctors. I'm sorry that Casey himself could not rid himself of a slight tendency in this direction, but fortunately I have fuller appreciation of him than he had. I'm repeating here a biblical injunction of my own, already mentioned elsewhere, that if my followers eat any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. This is what Casey could not believe, because he could not see that, as a son of God, he was invulnerable. Okay, so <clears throat> this was the reading of uh, the part of the chapter. And it might not be super access, yeah, accessible, you could say it, but uh, at the same time, there are certain aspects that I really love to emphasize one more time. So the thing with this is in the first seven chapters, there's a lot of these kinds of notes that are taken. So in which Jesus um, explains something related to the download of, of A Course in Miracles. Like he had to deal with uh, two persons writing it down um, that needed to actually uh, experience uh, it at the same time too. And uh, so you could see like that is not, um, say there was a lot of work. There was a lot of work. <laughs> and um, so I, I love to hear that because it, it makes it um, say, if you look at yourself in what you receive as information um, comes to you, but it, it finds its place in you, I could say. It's like it finds its place in you, but, but you don't really know how that works. And you also are not completely fully aware of your actions and the way that you think all the time. So there's always like an, uh, you could say, is disturbance, moments of clarity, but then also moments of darkness or moments of fear where you move through, not having no idea where it actually comes from. And you see in these notes, there's actually a lot of time spent on these um, things, like you could have done this, you could have done that, or I would never do this, is what Jesus said, I would never ask for any sacrifice. I would, I would always, it's like, always come to an, say, complete um, appreciation of who you are. So this uh, this is also part in in the in reading uh, the urtext, and it makes it um, kind of closer to yourself. At least that's how I experience it. It makes it closer to yourself, and also um, more forgiving to the way that you think about yourself. Like you're um, step by step, you become more and more aware of what is actually going on or how you actually have to uh, can take a look at yourself like here what is being said about edgar casey is that he loved to give to everyone but uh, to really receive it for himself was was a big yeah failure you could say like he didn't do that because he had an a deep sense of unworthiness now these these are signals 
um, to me, like these are signals uh, in the sense of take a look, take a look at how you are in your own um, say situation in your own spiritual life in your own uh, awakening process see what you're doing and um, in the sense of are you only focused on giving to others without forgetting to receive it for yourself or what is going on so that that puts more um, say focus on your own process when i read this all right so I wanted to take it easy today. I don't know if it was easy. Um, it was not easy to listen to for me. I, I have to laugh many times because of my own breathing that I could hear in the recordings. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry for that. <laughs> so it was like this microphone was right here. Um, and I, I wasn't aware of that. And not even in the, say, in the... Um, uh, listening to the audios again and trying to edit them a little bit. I wasn't aware of that. So anyway, it happened and I'm not going to do it again. So <laughs> it is funny. So I think it gets better uh, in during the recordings because I might have noticed it at a certain point. Atonement without sacrifice. So here's a good point then. So I in all this, there's never a sacrifice being asked. And that's such a wonderful idea to me because the tendency for me to think that I have to do something for it is certainly there. And here that has been taken away. Like, no, there's nothing that you have to do in order to receive the atonement. No, it's the other way around, it really is. So here are some expressions that you have heard in the reading too it's like the one of them is this the crucifixion did not establish the atonement the resurrection did well that's um that's a great one to read and of course you've heard this before i've shared this before um it's like the crucifixion did not establish the atonement like of course not luckily not so that there are still crucifixes all over the world uh, projected on walls or hanging in town like here in the, the city that i live still there are still all kinds of crucifix reminding us that the crucifixion did something in terms of atonement so that's <clears throat> that's the present state of the human condition you could say still believing in sacrifice and and crucifix so if the crucifixion is seen from an upside down point of view, it is certainly it certainly does appear as if God permitted and even encouraged his, one of his sons to suffer because he was good. Many very devoted ministers preach this every day, so up to today, this particularly unfortunate interpretation which always arose out of the combined misprojection of a large number of my own would-be followers has led many people to be bitterly afraid of God. Like if God does this with his most holy son, huh? that's, that's a great question. Like if, if God does this with his most holy son, like crucifying allowing him to be crucified on the cross well what is he gonna do with me <laughs> so how ridiculous is that you know how ridiculous is that so this this has been say leading to so much deep fear anxiety for death too because then the day of judgment is come and so this very good, like, perfect example of a resurrected one that is the direct son of God, maybe seen as an, an idol, maybe seen as something that you will never be able to get to, you know, as, as in, like, there's a Jesus kind of idea. 
so what is going to happen with me when I close my eyes, so to speak, when I, when I am passed into a different world? How am I going to be judged if Jesus hangs on the cross while he did everything right, performed miracles and taught nothing but truth? That doesn't look good. <laughs> that doesn't look good. So um, I'm so happy to hear this then, to see that this is over and that this, that this really is like loses all kinds of uh, understanding and and power like it slowly but certainly fades away it it just falls apart in the shining light of the love that god has for his son so that that is really great so on this first page this is being erased you could say like okay and <clears throat> this is no longer a myth myth is busted it's a, it's a busted myth. It's not going to happen. And you can talk as much about blood and sacrifice as you want, but that has nothing to do with the love of God for you. The resurrection demonstrated that nothing can destroy truth. Good can withstand any form of evil because light abolishes all forms of darkness. The atonement thus is the perfect lesson. It is the final demonstration that all of the other lessons which I taught are true. Man is released from all errors if he believes in this. Man is released from all errors if he believes in this. Atonement is a perfect lesson. The resurrection, say, the light can abolish all forms of darkness if you believe that then you see that all the lessons uh, that i taught are true then you see that all errors that you can possibly um, that all errors disappear by believing this light abolishes all forms of darkness so that's so great Nothing can prevail against the Son of God who commands his spirit into the hands of his Father. Okay, that, so that's another one of the statements. Like nothing can prevail against the Son of God who commands his spirit into the hands of his Father, who allows himself to be inspired hmm, by spirit to command his spirit into the hands of his Father. It's like to to give yourself to God, not as a sacrifice, no, as an awakening. By doing this, the mind awakens from its sleep and the soul remembers its creation. All sense of separation disappears and level confusion vanishes. So I'm I'm talking here about, say, the fundamental experience of the love of God. So it's like you, you command your spirit, you command your spirit in the hands of God. Like you allow this inspiration to occur to you. You allow healing, you could say. You allow the love of God to dawn in you and say all error disappears. It's, it's the place where your soul remembers God. It is, it is your experience of your beingness. You know, that's where this is about. And I, I love it that it is being said here and put in perspective and it's like very, very precisely put into. It's like Jesus says here too, is like the, the idea of twisting symbols around with your human mind is a very common thing so everything that is being said can be twisted around because in order to deny what it actually says the mind becomes very inventive and you recognize that too 
So that's why this commanding your spirit into the hands of God becomes like the practice and not as a one um, one time occasion but really as a practice like yes what else do you want to do it comes down to that what else are you going to do so in order to to stay in this recognition of your uh, wholeness that can only come to you when you command your spirit into the hands of God that is all taken care of you know only by that practice so by not letting your mind do its little deviant, uh, devious thing or valuing anything that's related to it no just allowing this to occur the inspiration to come to you okay so this is basically what I love to share today and um, so we're going to listen to some music and, and relax deeper into it um, so thank you so much for bearing with me and um, I love you thank you <laughs> 